Okay, so welcome to the Visco Creator Session. Thank you again and shout out to Visco for hosting this and providing an application for us to provide this information to the community and kind of just break down some of the gate kept knowledge that we want to share with you guys. So let's get into it. So like I said, my name is Delaney. I'm a visual artist and photographer. Um, my photography style is extremely editorial, ethereal. I mainly focus on uh, shooting women and shooting just like feminine narratives and stories. Um, I like to portray uh, figures in like figures of power in settings that they commonly weren't or historically weren't. So kind of like a way of me rewriting history a little bit. A little fun fact about myself as a photographer is that a lot of my, um, all of my photography is conceptual, but a lot of the concepts that I do shoot all come from like dreams originally. So this one here on the left of your screen is my most noteworthy photo. It's called The King is Dead. Um, I recently showed that at Freeze LA. Um, I showed that in my solo exhibition back in April 2022, actually. And then some of these are also from my more recent series called No True Receipt. And I just love portraying Black women in like figures of power, or just women in general as figures of power. So everything that I shoot usually is always conceptual, but a lot of times they come from like dreams. Um, I have lucid dreams every single time I dream, like even if I was to take a nap and fall asleep on y'all right now, I would be able to have some type of dream and then tell you like what happened. So that's kind of a little bit of where my inspiration comes from. Um, I keep a notepad on the side of my bed. I get inspired by almost everything. So that's a little bit about me and my practice for, as far as creating. But as of recent, as of the last five years, I've been doing more of um, becoming an exhibiting artist rather than just being like a service photographer or just doing like shoots for only clients. Um, it was really important for me to kind of use my platform to display the images that I wanted to see in a museum. Um, I grew up as like a, a kid who would go to art galleries and museums, but I could never see any types of art that I personally related to. So that kind of inspired me to get more into becoming an exhibiting artist and then putting on the wall what I wanted to see and how I wanted people to see themselves within my work on the wall. But yeah, um, so let's just dive right into it. Breaking into the art world. So I have, like I said, I've been exhibiting for like the last five years now. I've been shooting in total for eight years. And um, there's just some like key things that I've learned through my process that I want to share with you guys. And then also some really, really tangible assets that you can take from this talk today to apply like immediately after the talk, even if you want to message us or DM us to get started on your journey into the art world. So first things first, um, you always have to ask yourself your why. So you need to know like what you're doing it for. You need to know your why. What exactly do you want out of this? Um, is it just commissions? Is it just like sales in gallery? Do, are, do you just care about the viewership? Do you just care about getting your art out there into the world? Just always know your why. This point is super important because within the art world, there's so many different paths and pivots that you have to take. So just starting out having the foundation of why you want to do it is extremely important um and it doesn't matter what that is like there's no wrong answer for it if you're looking to be an exhibiting artist because you want to sell your art or just because you want to have your art on a bigger platform or even just get your work in museums like that's all fine just completely always know your why because the industry can throw you some curveballs every now and then but we'll, we'll get into that um also number two uh, do you understand that passions still require work? So this is a really important point because a lot of times I feel like the art world and the art community is portrayed as something that's extremely glamorous when it's like, it's still a lot of hard work. Um, Anthony and I will dive into this in a second. Like everything as an artist kind of like falls on you a lot of times, especially when you're starting out as far as like printing, um, reproducing your paintings uh the shipping costs oh my god like if you're shipping outside of wherever you stay like it's gonna be a thing like finding galleries to work with you finding galleries to represent you uh PR like 
all of this, there's an entire, of course, creative side is being an artist, but it's not only the creative side. So it's like, just be aware that there's going to be like some heavy lifting and some work that comes a part of it. And just be sure that you can make those pivots when they come. Um, and lastly, the biggest one is, do I have everything for my basic checklist? So to break into the art world, to just start like just getting your feet wet with becoming an exhibiting artist or in an artist as a whole, um, you really need to have like all of the things on this list, but the most important are having a substantial portfolio or website. Um, and that can be anything that doesn't always have to be you spending hundreds of dollars on making a website or countless hours on producing a website. It could be your Visco profile, it could be your Instagram, it could be some type of online portfolio, like a pixie set or something like that. As long as you have like a substantial amount of work to actually be shown, um, you're, you're in the right place. Like just formulate a project, think of something that you want to do, gather up like a whole collection of all of the work you have done and like put that all in the same thing together, get your statements about it together, get your information about each of your pieces together, whether it be photography or just artwork that's on canvas or sculpture, anything, just have a substantial portfolio of work. And also another important uh, one under that is your artist statement and bio. Um, the artist statement and bio is really important because almost everyone that you work with as an artist is always gonna ask you for that. Um, I'll show you guys some examples of how that would look on the next slide. Then the artist CV. So an artist CV is basically just an artist resume. Um, and I know that this is gonna like take some time for people to accumulate, but essentially just imagine like just a one pager or sometimes even a two pager of all of the exhibitions, all of the features, all of the commissions, awards, anything that you've accumulated within your artist career, all within the same document. This is basically just the artist version of a resume. And artist headshot, that's are really important, but that's like totally subjective. Like they, they can kind of almost be anything because you're an artist. Um, people aren't too hard up about that, but it's always good to have those. Always having an elevator pitch. So my elevator pitch is high. I'm Delaney George. I'm a visual artist. I'm a photographer. I'm a curator. You know, always be able to introduce yourself for like what you are as an artist and who you are and what your craft is. And then finally, probably the most important is a proposal or a proposal templates or a one pager or some type of pitch deck. Um, I will get into the importance of that in depth in a second, but just having something that basically can communicate the idea that you want to get across, why you want to work with the gallery, why you want to be an exhibiting artist or break into the art world is so important because you need to be able to visually and to be able to like physically communicate why people should work with you essentially and why your projects that you're creating and your art is important. And that's where the proposals and pitch decks come in, but we'll get to that in a second. But as far as... Um, your CV and your portfolio. I have here some examples. Um, this one is a more formal uh, example of a CV here on the right. Usually an artist CV, just because these are all things you just need to like start with. Um, it, it just has like your information, almost just like a resume, but just not as like, uh, not as extensive like job wise, but more so like where has your work been shown or what, what has your work been included in? So it's good to always include, of course, your email and your website or your portfolio link, of course, and then your name, a little bit about you. So like a, a shorter artist statement. And then this one is a little bit more formal. If you've had formal training, of course, that's great to put that on there. But if not, um, I know I didn't go to art school or anything like that. So it doesn't always have to be there. Um, you could always put like whatever exhibitions that you did, like here, any publications you may have done, uh, bigger publications, just, I mean, sorry, bigger commissions just anything that is extremely noteworthy for your art career and even if you're like saying well I haven't really done anything I, I haven't started out we're going to get into like where you can kind of like start building that up because that was also me like I couldn't I would see my counterparts and like some of my peers and they would have CVs like pages long of all the things that they've done but if you're trying to break into it you know naturally you're not going to have an extensive CV and that's okay. Um, sometimes if your CV only has three or four things, that's better than nothing, you know? And then moving on to Visco, 
with your portfolio, um, Visco is a really great place to like display your photos, especially like the range of the type of photography that you do. Websites are, of course, amazing as well. Um, one of the artists that I'm currently showing in a show that I create uh, curated called Who She Found in the Looking Glass, uh, Egypt. Her portfolio is amazing. She is a, a visual artist and a painter. She's incredible but this is her portfolio here so as soon as you go on her website you can see everything it's flushed out if you were to click in each of these it would not only have like the photos but it would have information about that so essentially like just providing people a way to look at like all of your work like if you want to work with someone or a gallery you want to make them have to search for as little as possible about you you just need to have a place where all of your information is and completing things and getting deals and partnerships with these people will be way easier when it's all in the same place. So feel free to use websites, of course, but if not, Visco is also a really, really great place to start that portfolio as well, especially because you can send links to your profile. Okay, and then moving on to artist statement, like we talked about earlier. Um, so there's a couple of different ways that you can do this artist statement. Um, for Egypt's About on her webpage, as you can see, this is all extremely like short. Um, it tells like a lot about her, but it's like more condensed. Um, as we all know, even with social media, people have a really, really short attention span. So I think the more condensed one, uh, I would call that more of like an artist's like bio rather than the actual statement because you can use artist statements for specific works or you can have an artist statement as a whole that's covering everything. Another artist that I'm showing now also in the same show that I curated, uh, Peyton, she's an amazing artist and painter as well, but hers is, um, her artist statement and bio goes a little bit further on from this. If you were to go to her website, I've linked them both here, which I'll share with you guys after the talk. But if you were to kind of keep scrolling, it's going on and on and on, which is amazing because it's giving you so much of like what she does and her practice and like all of these important parts about not only her as an artist, but also like how she actually does her craft. So there's no wrong way to really do it. It just depends on like knowing your audience and knowing people's attention spans and like what you want to give to the public. Um, another call out that I do want to point out though, Peyton has achieved several publications, as you can see, like Voyage LA, Black Design Collective, um, Marist here, oops, sorry, Marist here, um, just a couple of different accomplishments that she has. And as you can see, it's all, she has multiple paragraphs, but all of her accomplishments are kind of like set out first in the second paragraph, which is really good. Um, I think it's always best, especially when condensing even a CV or an artist statement that you kind of like, push your like cloud facts, anything that you have, whether it be like publications from years ago or like even awards that you received, put all of that in there. Like this is what people wanna see first, not only what you wanna do in a short statement about who you are as an artist, but also what have you done? Who have you worked with? Who are your top clients? All of that stuff matters when pitching to different people. And also before I move to the next slide, I just wanna let you guys know um, specifically for anyone who is on this call, if anyone is just starting out and you kind of want to do like a portfolio review before you put it online, or even if you just want general artist consulting, um, you can do that through gallery 90220. David at gallery 90220's email is here. If you guys just want to take a screenshot of this, or um, we will be sharing this information out after, but they're doing bookings and consultations for artists and portfolio reviews, and they're doing a discount specifically for anyone who attended the talk today. So if you just put, if you email David and put Visco Consulting in the subject line, uh, he'll follow up with you and give you like a discount for the talk. And Maya will share, share out all this information post-call as well. Okay, moving along. Okay, so let's say you have everything on your checklist, right? Um, you have your CV, you have your artist 
bio headshot all of that stuff like everything is just set in stone for you already you're ready to go so landing your first ex exhibition is like a really really big moment for you and even if you don't have your cvs together this can play into that because this can now go on that artist resume for you um the landing your first exhibition will teach you a lot of things about just gallery commissions um what they take versus what the artist takes home, the artist pricing, like how other artists actually price their work. You're learning more about the market and like what kind of audience takes to your work better. Just diving into your first show or just doing your first show is just an easier way for you to jump into the art world and kind of like understand like, okay, I did this, but like, here's where I need to go from this point forward. So um, usually when people have their first um, exhibition show, it's usually like a group show, or, you know, if you take an alternative route, like Anthony, it'll be your first show it would be a solo show, which he'll get into soon. But I just wanted to make sure I call this out for you guys, because my first show was actually um, a group show that was in New Orleans at Essence and I'll show you guys some pictures of that but um, all of these sites here which I will also send you guys links to these after the call cafe call for artists this site is amazing like you can go in the site you can even put in the type of medium of art that you're doing even if you only have one piece like let's say you're a beginner, you only have one piece, but you want to put this in a show, you want to get something on your resume, land a group show, you can put in the state that you're in, the city that you're in, the type of medium that you're in, and it'll pull up hundreds of calls for your area or your city. Or even if you're not in that city, let's say you want to do an international call or a call that's in another state and just ship your work. You can apply for all of these different open calls for artists. And essentially what these are is different galleries or different museums participate and have uh, group shows yearly, um, all the time really, year round. And they call for artists nationally or internationally. Some of them charge fees, some of them don't, but you can also filter that out on uh, Cafe Call for Artists. Um, this site was honestly one of the most helpful sites in my career, just because I would uh, sit in a coffee shop for like hours just applying to like multiple things, just trying to land some type of experience within the art community or just an a chance to necessarily display without having to like ask every museum or ask every gallery. Um, Cafe just makes it really, really easy for you. And then you can apply and upload all of that stuff from the checklist that we talked about right on the site. And then once you do that, it lives in that site forever. So if you ever see any other calls, all you have to do is just go and click and just apply. Even if you upload your work, it lives there forever. So even if you want to apply with the same work, it's basically an on, it's just like a one-stop shop. Just y'all go to go, go to cafe, like cafe is the best, trust me. But also some alternatives to cafe is also doing gallery and museum subscriptions. So if you have a local gallery near you or a local museum, sign up with them, get on their email list. Um, galleries and museums do open calls, like I said, all the time. There's always an exhibition or a show being planned. And sometimes it's just about shooting your shot, putting your work out there and just getting your work in the right hand. So keeping up with like what the local galleries around you or even national or international, just keeping up with what galleries and museums are doing is extremely important. So just find some that's near you, find some that you like and sign up for all their email lists. Eventually you will see in your email some like opportunities for open calls and other things like that. Um, another good site is called the Art Guide. They're kind of similar to signing up for subscriptions. They just post open calls daily as well as entry thingy hundreds of open calls internationally, nat nationally, daily. Um, they'll tell you which ones have submission fees and which ones don't. Another one that I really, really love that I think is cool that um, I got a long time ago is called Save Art Space. So this company is really interesting because they don't, they charge you like, of course, like an application fee, which usually isn't more than like $30, but it can, it could be as low as $10. But basically you apply uh, by submitting some of your artwork, a photo, a painting, a graphic design, a sculpture, anything. And if they, if their curators for that month choose your work, they're going to put your art on a billboard in a city in America. And it's like, 
honestly like not that hard to get either um I know I've done two with them but it's an it's a national open call they just have different themes and if your theme for your artwork fits what they're trying to curate on their billboards for that month they'll choose you and they'll put the artwork up this is of no charge to you it's your name blasted on the billboard it's your photo or your your sculpture or your artwork blasted on the photo like what is better than that to be like your first entry in the art world like how many like I don't know how much a billboard costs but like I'm pretty sure it's like a ticket so it's like to get a free billboard like that's nuts and they do it every month like every month you can apply to a new call so your chances are going to be really high to get a free billboard essentially and you never know who's going to see it either um another thing that you can find open calls on is like literally hashtagging hashtagging open call on all social media platforms um even if you were to go on your instagram right now and just do open call i'm pretty sure you would see like a bunch of different like galleries or places that are accepting artists um visual artists performance artists almost anything for whatever they're doing at that time and it's just about really just analyzing all of these applications is just about analyzing where your work fits, you know, like uh, each show is going to have a curatorial thesis or a statement that's explaining what type of art they're looking for. And sometimes your work will align with that and sometimes it won't. But luckily, there's so many applications and different sites in the world that you could just keep this going forever. Group show after group show if you wanted to or solo show after solo show if you wanted to with, through open calls. So for my journey, just a little bit about it. I know I spoke about it earlier. Um, my first um, experience with diving into the art world was when I displayed at Essence Fest, I believe 2018. Um, this was uh, the photos here. They had a group exhibition that was speaking about Black sisterhood that was sponsored by Coca-Cola and myself and two other photographers works were chosen this was just the photo that I wanted to show you guys but this was really cool because I learned a lot there too now the works weren't for sale in the traditional way but I got to learn about what what the audience was audience were saying about my work um how the printing process worked how this entire show was curated like who was able to build these structures and buy all of this and put this work in the show contracts uh licensing other people like to be a part of my work like multiple things. So it was a really great experience. And then it kind of just kept going from there. Um, after that, I did another group show in New Orleans called Lion's Shadow at a black owned gallery called the Stella Jones Art Gallery. That was amazing. Um, the crowd really took to my work here. This is me being in awe about it or whatever, like second, third show. And then um, I did another show. This is all like, I think within like the same year, year and a half, by the way, like it just kept, I just kept, I was just like, I just want to keep exhibiting. Like, I just want to keep like framing my art and putting it on the wall. Like I, I just became like obsessed with it. So then I went to another gallery called Woman Made Gallery and they had a group show um, displaying like uh, just female empowerment for that month. And that was in Chicago. I, I, that, I displayed this one in Chicago. And then the next show was in Poughkeepsie, New York, where I displayed this photo here. And this is me about to like ship it out. So it kind of like all just kept going from there. But it really took off when I decided, okay, like all of these works were works that I had been shooting for like a good while, but like, are just archival works that I had already done projects for and I had it on hand. But I started a project in 2019 called Notre Receipt, which was basically um, showing five different concepts uh, that I created of how I see Black women and the Black women that I grew up with. And I created like a 15 page extensive, extensive proposal, pitch deck, whatever you wanna call it, sending it out to every single gallery that I showed in, of course, but also that I feel like aligned with the, the type of work that I was creating and showing. Um, this is just a little bit from the proposal. It's missing like some other details and like the budget, but I didn't wanna overload y'all. But like each one of these slides is like a page. And this is like how all of the work like came into fruition. So this took me like a while to do as well. I don't think it has to take a long time, but I just knew I had an idea, I had a concept. 
it took me a while to actually shoot it all. And then I'm like, okay, now I finally have my selects. I have everything that I want to show. And now I'm going to like put it into a proposal, explain each of the shoots concepts. Even some of these actually even switched out like Southern Mystic actually got replaced with the King is Dead. So it, it changes over time. But I also like even planned like my entire exhibition um, I did like a budget. I basically made sure that there was little to no room for anybody that I sent this proposal to to say no. So this is something that I really want y'all to take away from this. Um, make sure whatever proposals or pitch decks that you do create for people, don't leave them any room to say no. Like you're pitching it to these galleries, you're pitching it to a curator and museum. Um, have everything laid out for them. Um, have your budget, know how much everything is gonna cost state what you can pay for and what you can afford and what you may need assistance with like tell them even even go as far as like this is why you should have this exhibition here this is why you should work with me because your audience will receive it in this way like literally leave no room for like guessing like only leave room for them to say yes like like almost like a plug and play like if you create pitch decks and proposals that are that extensive to where it's like they won't even have any questions it's always a higher chance of you getting that exhibition or getting a solo or whatever you want to get essentially as long as you're making like really undeniable work and you have like all of your stuff in order and you research everything people will appreciate that because that's the less that they have to do so your chances are automatically going to be higher um I have a quick question actually and someone just asked asked this in the chat yeah and I thought about this too um do you like did you and forgive me if you already mentioned this do you work off like a template for this or did you come up with this all on your own and if yes is this like available for other creators to follow this structure so no that's a great question I definitely um I gotta find so honestly I made this in Canva I didn't actually have a template but I did make it in Canva because like I was so not tech savvy at the time when I made this so I was like I didn't know what other site to really do it on for real but yeah I made it in Canva just to make sure I could get my point across and if anybody wants me to share this canva template with them i definitely don't mind um i haven't had to do one in a while so like i definitely don't mind sharing this with anybody who wants to have it because i'm pretty sure i still have like the the edited version that i can just copy and send but no i didn't i didn't have a template um unfortunately also like i'm the only oops I'm the only one in my family as well as kind of in my circle that has kind of been navigating in the path that I have so it's like I kind of really didn't have that much guidance on this at all like and looking at it now I'm just like this is like chaotic because it's like so many colors and all this other stuff going on I'm like a normal business probably like wouldn't go for this but all in all like y'all can reach out to me I like know how to clean stuff up better now but this is so old but um but yeah, like just go for it, to be honest, like, and honestly, less is more. Um, my agent now always tells me like, always have like a one pager versus an entire deck, like don't show your, your full hand and stuff like that. But I can definitely send y'all the template like for this proposal and like how I, at least how I did my research so y'all can make something as extensive because I understand if like people don't have time to read all 17 pages that I did, but yeah. But also like for this, um, I definitely want to make it known I got a lot of no's before I got my yes, like, and not because I thought that the work wasn't good or, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like, like, basically, I sent out this proposal to as many people as I could, I literally would be in New Orleans at my favorite coffee shop. And I would sit there, like, I think I did this for three months. I would sit there like every week, like at least four days out of the week on like nine to five style, like sitting there from like 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. researching galleries, researching open calls, almost like it was a job. Like I treated it like it was a job and just sending this whole deck with different like email templates out to multiple people, like multiple galleries, just hoping that somebody would give me a shot to display this solo exhibition and um like I said I got a lot of no's before I finally got the yes but I didn't let any of those no's deter me because it's like I believed in this work for so long like I shot this in 2019 and it's still being shown in 2023 so 
it's like don't let any of the no's get you down or like don't let anybody try to like deter you from like the path you're on because you will find somebody either your audience or a person or a gallery or whoever to align with what you're doing you just have to do the research and send it out to as many people as possible and I always tell people that like even though the information that you have to collect before you become an exhibiting artist, artist can be tedious and all the stuff you have to get it's like in the end once you get to the point where you have all this stuff you could just drop it in an email or drop in an application like you want to roll and it's like if you can do what I did apply to 30 calls a day apply like email every gallery email every museum because your odds of getting with them are going to be higher now because you email so many you know and it's not like you're giving away the work either it's like what if they all say yes? And I'm sure some people in this chat, like y'all are talented, like they probably will all say yes. And then you're going to have like a tour of like exhibitions for the whole year. So yeah, just keep going. Just keep going. Treat it like a job at first and just stay consistent. Well, yeah, so that's a little bit about being an exhibiting artist. I know I said a lot, but I just wanted also before I close it out with my last few slides, just let you guys know that um, being an exhibiting artist is not the only route that you have to take. Um, a lot of times with it being a, an exhibiting artist, there's like 50% creative and 50% business side. I know like me personally, I've been kind of more so drowned on the business side uh, for right now. So it's like, you also have to remember you're a person, you're, you're an artist and you need to make time to keep creating, but it's like also like you have to keep the train going as far as like where you're displaying as well. But that's not the only route you have to take. Um, there's many possibilities and opportunities. Uh, and if you guys wanna talk about this and further after the call, um, we can, and hopefully for our next session, I can bring on some people in these specific fields, but you can be an artist who licensed your art for TV and film. So whenever you're watching your favorite show on Netflix or your favorite movie, do you ever think like all of this stuff is planned, like the art that's on the wall that's shown is there, the artwork that's done for like the logos and the covers of the movies, that's all different artists being commissioned to do these things. You can also be simply a commissioned artist. I know hundreds of artists in LA who never exhibit their work, but they're constantly having clientele. Like they're constantly getting books to do portraits or like private commissions for private collectors and all types of stuff. Um, you could become a teaching artist. You could be someone who is like literally at a college or a prestigious art school that is teaching other students, which that also gives you a lot of uh, viewability as well, just because of like how um, intertwined the art community is with education as a whole. And then you could also be a small works and market-based artist. Um, there's several markets in LA that always have in support artists like Black Market Flea, um, Black on the Block. There's, uh, I just did Freeze Art Fair. There's 415 in London. Um, there's some artists that I know who really just only do markets and art fairs. That's also another realm that you could do as well. Um, you could be a public art artist. Um, I know a lot of muralists. I know a lot of people who do just different designs on the sides of buildings or even like within people's homes. Um, one of my good friends who is um, an OG designer, Rebecca Moses, uh, she just redid someone's bathroom completely and she got commissioned for that. Like never did it before, but they just love her aesthetic and that's like what she's doing now. So shout out to her. And then also finally, you can license your work for commercial property. This is something that I'm actually trying to get into. Um, if you ever been to a hotel or Airbnb or a restaurant, anything like that, even just staging a house for real estate, like, do you ever wonder how the photographs that's in there are chosen or how the artwork in those hotels are chosen? Like all of that stuff plays a part into like an artist being commissioned for that work. So it doesn't always just have to be you exhibiting. There's many possibilities. And finally, um, where I want to close at is just put yourself out there. Um, honestly, a lot of the a lot of the art world relies on connections and people and like 
who you know and who's going to support you. So wherever you are in the world, like connect with your local curators, connect with your fellow artists that are around you. If there's an art show that's going on, it's a big group show or it's a solo show, go to that show, support them, show your support, but also transparently ask like, hey, like, how are you doing this? How do I give my work in there? And I know that like not everyone will probably always be open to that because gatekeeping is just like a thing, but that's why we're doing these sessions. That's why there's people like Anthony and I. So even if they don't, they don't respond to you well, please DM us, talk to us, ask us, we're here. But definitely support your local art things and happenings that are going on, as well as like going to other fairs, like see how things work, support local shows, activations. Um, building a relationship within your art community is key because the more people that you let know that like, hey, like this is what I do, or like this is the type of art I do and this is my specialty, that will that's gonna stay with them and then they're gonna come back to you when an opportunity arises. Like um the show that I'm even curating now that's this photo is coming from who who she found in looking glass um this artist here alexandra she is insanely talented insanely talented painter um sculptor multiple things model and i honestly been i had been following her for a while and she finally started like putting herself out there and putting her work out there and i'm just like your work should be in an art show and that's kind of like how we connected or even like um this this show was a group show that released for uh, that was when the Emmett Till movie came out. So they did uh, an exhibition around the film called Impact of Images. And my image was in there and it was like one of the most sought after in the show. And if I didn't know the people that I knew at the time and knew that I would, they knew that I was doing this show and an artist, I basically everything is like a domino effect because I had a solo in April someone saw this work and was like referred me to the show there and now I have like kids and other people looking at it also fun fact shout out to Jeremy Tarek um this is an artist from New Orleans his work it also ended up right next to mine we're both from New Orleans we're showing in LA so it's like you never know what could happen. Like putting yourself out there is going to be the best thing for you. But um, speaking of community, I would like to introduce my special guest for today, Anthony Freeman. Um, I have been a personal fan of this man's work for so long and he's just so amazing. And how I spoke to you about alternative routes that you can take, Anthony is about to take you through a whole journey of his story of like, just being like, super independent and doing his own solo shows he's a 15 time correct me if I'm wrong 15 time solo show artist and he's been able to bring out crowds every single time and sell works every single time but it's not all as glamorous as I make it sound I'm gonna let him talk about it more my name is Anthony Freeman um I've been a photographer for as long as I can remember um I'm 30 now I started in high school it was kind of just like I was always the guy with the camera. I was taking pictures, you know, of, of what interested in me. And it really started kind of like as a documentarian, just documenting my friends, you know, just that guy with the camera shooting my friends. And it developed into a passion when I started really like shooting film around like 18. And I really fell in love with the medium of photography way more. Um, and yeah, it was just kind of my, my way to escape and kind of find my purpose in life. Um, I've been doing um, galleries. My first gallery show was in 2015. Um, I've actually I've done 11 solo shows. I've been in 15 all together um, group shows, like 15 shows all together. Um, but yeah, 11 solo shows that I've independently produced myself. I've kind of um, yeah, I guess independence is a good good word. Um, I haven't really done like the traditional route as far as like open calls and pairing with like official galleries. I've kind of like tried to find spaces that I could throw frames up on and invite as many people as I could and sell frames. That was kind of like my initial business um, blueprint. Um, so yeah, you can actually go to the next next slide. Um, so yeah, here's some of my works. Um, yeah, I've just been shooting forever and it's just like a passion of mine. I've went broke shooting film 100 plus times you know, I'll, I'll just keep shooting and not pay rent. It's like a bad, whatever, you know, I'm just passionate about it. This is what I do. This is what I live and breathe. Um, and I really, um, I guess one of the subjects that really got me into um, amassing a big body of work was like shooting vintage cars, you know, um, 
we all we all follow photographers who like to shoot old old cars on film you know I was definitely doing that I was like shooting car corners and stuff like hella years ago and stuff and it was just like fascinating to me documenting cars that I know we won't be seeing as much of going into the future like our kids and their kids will see less of so that was kind of like it's like a time capsule and especially like shooting on film they just I was trying to when I compose an image I try to remove all modern elements if I can so it looks like this photo could have been shot you know in the 70s 80s or whatever um and then you know keeping it modern with with obviously I'm shooting people today um and I don't try to hide that but um that's kind of my style I've developed over the years um and so like growing up um I've I've lived all over LA Arizona Texas Oklahoma Maryland Virginia DC I've lived in Germany my dad was in the military so I grew up all over which kind of gave me just a wide perspective on a lot of things and kind of gave me this just natural curiosity about the world that I've been able to kind of put into my photography um and kind of I'm just going to go over like my independent route of doing galleries but um even before I say anything else I just want to say like the best piece of advice I could give is to just be your biggest fan and be overly confident you know I know a lot of people who are very talented who don't have the follow through or confidence to make things happen for themselves and you know thank god there's people like Delaney and stuff and curators who are able to be like hey you need to show your work you need to put this up boom boom and kind of put a battery in people's back and I always try to be that person as much as I can too um, that's the best thing you could do you know um, you could always look up to people and admire people's works but they are no more or less capable of doing big things than you are like we're all equally capable in this life and I think I've been able to imagine just like Delaney I've been able to imagine and dream of things I wanted to do and I've done a lot of the things that I wanted to do and it's very rewarding because life is not promised and you know I think I'll get more to that um I started a gallery series last year called still here um which is kind of my overall ethos on, on all of it like I'm still here and no nothing's guaranteed and I just try to maximize every day I'm here you know and do as much as I can um but yeah so just just be your biggest fan and you know um whatever you want to do go for it um and really go for it um and if it's put together a gallery you know I really hope you do that and knock it out the park I can't wait to go to it you know um the most rewarding um part of all this though to me is like having my frames in people's homes like I started out and I still probably sell my my frame for way too cheap. Um, it's not always about making the most money to me, but I know as I evolve as an exhibiting artist, naturally, you know, you raise the price on stuff. But I used to sell things for damn near out cost just to get people to like, oh, you want this frame for real? Like, I'll bargain with you. You want it at half price? I just want it to be in your home. It means a lot to me that someone would want a frame of mine in their home because I I was telling Delaney this yesterday, but like, I like photography and photos more than anyone I know. And I have never once bought a frame from somebody. I don't know if I'm ashamed of that or not, but like, I need to change that. But it just means a whole lot to me when someone actually buys a frame for me. So the fact that I've been able to do that hundreds of times at this point is just like mind boggling to me. Um, and yeah, it just means everything to me, you know, and kind of, I got addicted to it. You know, I sold one frame and did one show and kept going and now you know I'm able to sell a good amount of frames each show and it's just it's a surreal feeling um that I think every photographer should be able to experience um let me know so you want kinda, me um what's that let me know you want me to switch okay lines. yeah I got you. you you stay right here uh still um so yeah my first gallery show was in 2015 like I said um I've had at least one show every year since 2015 up until 2023 minus 2020 um when COVID hit and I was eager to get back doing shows after COVID I was like I hated COVID I mean I know every day everyone did but it was it was terrible um my, my first show was just simply titled places I had 10 pieces up I didn't sell a, a piece that show um this was yeah back in 2015 I ran it back the next year with places too and very very humble beginnings it wasn't the biggest space I teamed up with this guy Steven who um in the city he had a lot of money and stuff and he kind of liked my photo work and he, I was able to kind of um use his space um 
and do my first show. Um, and yeah, I'm grateful for that. And then in 2018, I um, did my first like proper month long exhibition with DNA Gallery. And it was my first time like working with an official gallery and less of a independent thing. And that was really cool. Um, I sold some pieces. That was my first time experiencing like the whole gallery is going to take 50% of your I was like, whoa, but um, it was cool. I was still thankful to like, you know, sell some pieces, but that was a learning experience. And I think from that, I was kind of like leaning more towards like, I like to do it myself, cut all the middlemen out and produce my own show and keep all the money. Um, It was still a good learning experience. I was glad I did it. And then, but yeah, fast forward a few years later after COVID was fading, I remember, um, I had tweeted, I had some frames for sale. um, And I was like, and then I tweeted back to myself, like, man, maybe it's time to do another gallery show. Cause at that point it had been, I guess a year and a half, almost two years since I've done one and I was itching to do one. And then from that tweet, like a bunch of my friends tweeted like, yeah, you should do another gallery. And within three weeks I had another solo exhibition and that was fresh after COVID. And I didn't know what to expect after COVID and it was packed and I actually sold 26 pieces that night. And it, it was mind blowing. I was like, wow. So I, I um, funneled the success of that and the money of that into another show two months later. Um, the show was called Saturday Night Special. That was one of my favorite shows. Um, it was just a collection of all my all time favorite photos and specifically a lot of like nighttime long exposure photos that um, I've been doing on film, just going out at night with a tripod, finding old cars and and yeah, just shooting and composing images. and. Anyway, so yeah, that was a special, special one to me. I actually met my now fiance at that gallery. She came, didn't know me. Um, so that one has a special place in my heart for sure. Um, and that show went well. And um, these are all, these are like one day independent shows I'm doing where I, I, I do all the damn installation and work, put it up for one day. And the next day I'm in there tearing it down, working hard with, you know, one or two friends, maybe sometimes they can't make it. I'm by myself in there just putting the work in but you know it's worth it to me and this is what I live for um so after that show went well I did another show this was um two months later again so this was three shows in six months and um it was called Hearts of Men this was the first big group show that I ever curated I picked four um artists from across different states um a few of them from the Bay Area one of them from Oklahoma City um and one in LA one from LA um and we all um we had like tribute pieces to kind of people we lost it was um titled hearts of men i lost my father to a sudden heart attack my best friend he had an enlarged heart and died on his birthday due to complications so like i think like having trauma and grief and depression from all this as men you kind of bottle it up and don't know what to do with it maybe you have anger problems because of it or whatever whatever and this was just like really rewarding way to put all that pain and stuff into one show and so like my my um one of my good friends really um he he had just lost one of his best friends in a car crash very young and so we we all had tributes and stuff like someone had a tribute to their grandpa and had his trumpet up with a painting and like it was a really special show and I was just glad to put that one um together and be able to kind of do something from you know, pain that we have went through in our life. Um, so yeah, that one was really um, rewarding. And it was kind of full circle to me um, because I did it at the Bird Museum. You can see kind of in the bottom three photos, that was the Bird Museum um, in LA on Pico. Um, shout out to Brittany Bird for um, giving me her beautiful space. Um, where'd you zoom go? Oh, anyway, so um, that show was really rewarding because one of my biggest inspirations um, really um He's a Bay Area photographer, shoots film, lowriders, portraits that are beautiful. Check him out on Instagram. Supreme Thing is his name. Supreme Thing with an A. But he inspired me to do galleries. He was the singular person that inspired me to do what I'm doing, honestly. Um, And he doesn't even take it as serious as he should. But the way he was doing it was like he was going to bars and like little spaces and putting up frames of like lowriders and portraits of people he was shooting and stuff at bars and he was just having like these cool recap photos after of like him and his friends drinking beer in front of cool lowrider frames and it just seemed cool to me it wasn't this like prim and proper 
gallery setting that maybe we're used to seeing and it was just kind of it just kind of put a battery in my back like I like this I'm gonna use this as a template and I was able to ask him to be part of this hearts and men show and he was one of the artists um so we 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 ended up becoming friends and stuff we were just internet friends at first and we formed a real real life um connection and someone I still talk to to this day so that was a cool full circle moment to me being able to do a group show with someone that that inspired me um but yeah, you can go to the next slide too. Um, so with this Visco course, I want to really get into some tangible strategies to follow through. If you're looking to produce your own gallery show, you know, just tips that I have, you know, number one, just shoot, you know, like Delaney said, like we have to have bodies of work. You can't just start taking pictures and think you're going to do a gallery and it's going to be a hit. You know, there's a lot of work behind the scenes that goes into it and you need to have, you know, a large body of work ready to go. You know, I've been shooting over a decade and have amassed a huge body of work. Um, and I think that's the key, you know, like I, I like metaphors a lot and like, I, I love music and like people could be talented musicians, but they're not a good recording artist. They don't spend the time in the studio um, and someone that spends the time in the studio is going to probably get further. So it's the same type concept here with photography to me. Like you need to shoot a lot, you know, period. Um, network, um, network, network, network. You know, what good is a show if it's empty? Um, go to all local gallery openings and meet people. Make yourself relevant in the um, field you want to be taken serious in. You know, that's key. I, I go out to every single event I can in L.A., and I think that has done me well. And I've been able to get the same people, um, just the same energy back. You know, I'm at all these things. They're going to come to my thing that I'm advertising. Um, and it's just like a paying it forward type thing. Um, and then finding gallery spaces and reaching out, building those contacts, whether it's searching on Instagram, TikTok, Google, you know, um, galleries aren't hard to find, you know, and they all have an email and contact and they want to hear from you. So reach out and build these lists um and then save money galleries cost money you know if i'm broke you ain't gonna see me doing a gallery point blank i'm just not you know um and as a creative there's a lot of ups and downs sometimes it's like damn i'm doing well and sometimes it's like where did it all go i'm broke so you know um definitely save your money and be strategic you know don't put yourself in a hole if it's really not right don't do a show yet you know save up and plan it accordingly um Galleries can cost anywhere from like $5,000 and up, you know, depending on how many pieces you choose to show, you know, among other variables. Um, and then pitch decks, pitch decks are super important. Like Delaney was talking about, like, I feel like me and her could have an entire session on pitch decks alone, you know, pitch decks are super important. Pitch decks can score you sponsors and sponsors can um, alleviate costs off your back. You know, um, I paired with, um, a cannabis company awesome dope for four shows in a row and they sponsored it and they paid for the gallery space for the day and they also um had an open cannabis bar you know something that maybe you, you don't see at a lot of galleries but i was open to i like cannabis i was like i have drinks like it's just another thing to kind of keep people there and it was just a good it was a good partnership we had um for sure so make as many um detail pitch decks as you can and just send them out as much as you can because you'll get one at least you know maybe you get a hundred you know I, I recently made a recent pitch deck um trying to find anyways I sent it out over 50 times in one day and scored a few so like definitely pitch decks are super important um and then picking a date and start planning you know really locking a date and start planning um and then you can go to the next slide and then so yeah Framing and installing. Um, number one, I just say invest in good glass frames. I see a lot of like beginning, you know, exhibiting artists or like photographers more. So I'm talking more about, um, but like it costs a lot. So maybe you're not going to get the good quality glass frame. But I just want to say, get the glass frame. Don't get the plastic plexiglass. Don't, don't do that to yourself. I just feel like it cheapens your work without you even really consciously knowing it you know um I started out in 2015 with glass frames I'm proud to say and it just makes a difference I would say you know um as far as framing go for glass frames um as far as places go to Michael's you don't have to go to these expensive 
specialty framing places that are going to cost you 300 a frame like please don't do that unless you got it like that but you can go to michael's and they have professional glass frames um you can get photo wire yourself wire back the back of the frame so it's easier to hang um some of these photos you can see a mat um white mats in i started matting my photos um the more i went on um I just feel like it gives it a nice museum professional touch to it versus just having a full size photo in the frame, which, you know, could look nice too, but I like the white mat. That's another thing you can get in bulk on Amazon, you know, order, order specific mats, depending on the size of frame on Amazon, um, things like that. And then thrift stores too. Also, you can get lucky and find a nice glass frame at a thrift store for mad cheap, you know, and it might look vintage and have this cool, gold bumps to it it look you know I, i've definitely scored some good um frames at thrift stores um and another thing i would say is frame your pieces yourself like i said like some people go to professional framers i'm not knocking that but a good tip of mine that i've always followed is like skipping the middleman as much as you can um like i am a like i said i like music a lot like nipsey hustle was my number one favorite artist and he spoke heavily on skipping the middleman um and basically it just gives you a lot more hands-on you save money and you're just more in control this way um and just just a lot of his like business messages in, in his music um really I applied to my hustle and photography and he um yeah he just overall preached the message of being on a marathon with your craft and had this ethos of continuation something that I follow with my own hustle as well like I said and the ultimate belief in oneself and never letting anything get between you and your dreams point blank period um and that's something I live daily you know it's, it's important to me to find inspiration and keep it close to me and relevant in my head um and I like to share this with people this is how I speak every day when I'm talking to people this is just you know I like to inspire and, and, and be positive and because you never know, you know, your life could work out best case scenario. And I think people need to give themselves that chance for the opportunity. But um, back to the prints, though, um, printing your work, I would say slowly accumulate your prints so it isn't so much all at once. Um, like my home, I, I have frames all over my home. Like I like to treat my home like my own personal practice gallery. I'm going to stare at this frame every day in my home for a while and digest it and be like, OK, this is it. Like, because another thing, picking your prints and curating your own work could be tricky sometimes. Sometimes I put up pieces and I'm like, man, I shouldn't have done that one. And over time, you get better at it. And like my last show, Still Here 4, which you could see in a bunch of these pictures in the top. I liked every picture I picked. Thank God. You know, I had this was the most frames I did in the show. This was I had 38 frames up um, and I liked all of them. Um, there was no regrets on any of them. So I think as you go on, you kind of start to get better at picking your own prints. Um, and yeah, and then try with local print shops um, or try online printing shops, you know, things like Vista Print or something like just try different shops and, and shop around and see what fits your budget. Um, and then the next slide. Um, and just a heads up, we are running a little bit low on time and we have a Okay, cool, cool, cool. Sorry. <laughs> um, advertising. So like, yeah, I, I feel like I do the most with advertising. I got my bachelor's degree in advertising. I started doing graffiti of the names of my galleries. I print out flyers and we paste them all over. I just do the most with advertising because it helps. It really does. So I would say, don't be afraid of advertising. Don't be afraid of that step, you know? Um, advertise as much as you can and be creative um and then the next slide and then i think creating an atmosphere at your gallery that makes people stay is important to me um do you want people to stop by and view your work and leave or do you want people to stop by stay and hang out and chat and i think i've created an atmosphere at all of my galleries now that people stay they'll come at 6 p.m and be there at midnight and that's cool to me um I have DJs I have music going the whole time I have you know Jamaican food pizza vendor um I've had flash tattoo artists you know I've had dr uh, drink bars cannabis bar I, I offer a lot of things I don't do all of them at every single one but these are some elements that I like to introduce into some shows depending on the feel of it and how I want um and then the next slide 
I've even had like short music performances. You know, I never wanted to be about music because it's an art show, but like picking specific people for moments and having them do one song is cool to me. Like J305 is this rapper I was working with at that moment doing music videos. And it was his 10 year anniversary of this song, Use a Flip. It's a staple LA hit song. If you, you know, from here, you know it. And then and it was a viral moment. It was crazy. Um, And then another one, I had this vision of, in the bottom right, um, I had this vision of a piano in the middle of my gallery and having this moment of cutting all the lights off and simultaneously cutting red lights on and having um, this R&B rap group play Kanye's Runaway. So it starts with the keys, like all of a sudden the lights turn off, the red lights are on and there's this guy at the piano playing Kanye's Runaway. And it was a really beautiful moment. That was something I thought of in my head and then I executed perfectly. And it was it was great. You can find that on my Instagram if you scroll down. Um, and then the next slide is my last slide, um, making money part. Um, I talked to Delaney about this and she wanted me to kind of briefly cover it, but I never count on selling my frames. You know, I do these galleries at this point with the business expertise that I'm going to make all my money back and then some off of other things. I sell t-shirts, I sell drinks, I have QR codes, all that money goes directly to me. So it's icing on the cake when I sell a frame. Sometimes I'll sell a lot of frames and I'm sitting good and I'm ha hella happy, you know? Sometimes I sell a few and it's all good because I sold all my merch and I sold plastic wrap prints, you know? You could do matted plastic wrap prints, get those in bulk on Amazon. Um, like you see the little Playboy print. This is one of my, my most famous prints. I've sold a bunch of them, um, something I shot in Dallas, Texas. But having things like this to make you money back that are untraditional in gallery settings, like having my own bar and having a friend bartend for me. We make our own margaritas and then I make, you know, money off that alone. And yeah, 